Good morning and welcome to the December edition of Bar Talk, an eight part series created as a special thank you to the Washington Ballet's donors and supporters. I'm Patrick Muhlenschulter, the Managing Director of the Washington Ballet, and on behalf of the artists, teachers and staff, it's an honor to thank you all for the support that you have shown us. I'd like to make special thanks and a warm welcome this morning to the Board of Directors, the Artistic Directors Council, our Board of Ambassadors, the Ballet Main and Ballet Corps supporters, the Women's Society and Jate Society, and our institutional partners in government, foundations, and corporations. It's your support that's keeping us going right now. Thank you. That support also means we're able to share this special eight-part series, Bar Talk, with a wide viewing audience, our subscribers and our single ticket purchasers, friends and family, to better enrich everyone's lives with a better understanding of the beauty and joy of ballet. During our discussion, if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, you can do so in the YouTube's comment field under the video stream. That's if you're watching on a laptop or a computer. Let's go over now to Dr. Natalie Ruland, who's going to be our guide today as we go back through time to the court of the Russian Tsars. The Washington Ballet Scholar in Residence, Dr. Ruland is the Senior Advisor for the Billington Cultural Initiative at the prestigious Kennan Institute here in Washington, DC. A scholar of Russian literature, culture, and performing arts, Natalie is currently completing her first book, Ballet Empire, The Russian Era, Dobre jutro, Natalie. Dobre jutro, Patrick. What are we looking at today? Well, Patrick, we're very excited today. We have a really thrilling conversation that we'll be having, of course, with Julie, our artistic director, as well as two featured guests um, who will be talking about the music of Tchaikovsky's Imperial Russian Ballet, The Nutcracker. I'm going to crack an egg out of my Fabergé eggshell and enjoy the show. Thank you so much, Natalie. Over to you. Thank you, Patrick, for your kind introduction. Thank you to Julie, the staff of the Washington Ballet, and the generous support of the Ballet Oman Society in bringing this series to life. Welcome to our December edition of Bar Talk. As we've mentioned during our previous episodes, Fridays have a very special significance for the Washington Ballet, as our co-founders Lisa Gardner and Mary Day hosted a series of intimate ballet evenings called Fridays at Nine during World War II. We hope you'll continue to join us throughout the year for our exclusive behind the scenes conversations every month on Fridays at 10. Last month, Julie and I hosted a fascinating conversation with Professor Kara U. Lehman on George Balanchine's 1941 ballet Concerto Parocco. And today we will go even farther back to the 19, excuse me, to the 1892 Russian ballet and contemporary American holiday classic, The Nutcracker. The Washington Ballet's production of The Nutcracker by Septime Webb has charmed Washington audiences since 2004. Let's take a look at the 15th anniversary video from last year.
That is such a beautiful production that brings back so many wonderful memories from last year. And we look forward to seeing that in the near future, we hope next year. Now, in addition to the charmingly DC Nutcracker currently in the Washington Ballet's repertoire, the original production by Washington Ballet co-founder Mary Day dates back even further to 1961. Mary Day enchanted Washington with her beloved family classic featuring accompaniment by the National Symphony Orchestra and the choreography of Alexandra Danilova, the famed ballet russe dancer who studied along with George Balanchine at the Imperial Theater School in St. Petersburg. Danilova's choreography was based on the ballet that she and Balanchine learned as young dancers in Russia and brought with them as emigres to America in the first half of the 20th century. Now this very first Nutcracker premiered at the Marinsky Theater of St. Petersburg on December 6, 1892. Here we see the original Clara and Nutcracker Prince, two roles which were later performed by Danilova and Balanchine. The Nutcracker was based on the 1844 adaptation by Alexander Dumas of Etia Hoffman's 1816 Tale of the Nutcracker and the Mouse King. The ballet capitalized on the recent success of The Sleeping Beauty from 1890 and also featured the music of Pyotr Tchaikovsky, the choreography of Marius Petipa and Lev Ivanov, and the dream team which would bring us the 1895 production of Swan Lake. And we see here the original costume design from 1892. The Petersburg Gazette declared the score the best of Tchaikovsky's ballets, and the myriad iterations over the course of the 20th century have made the Nutcracker one of the most famous ballets of the classical canon, and certainly the most popular. The waltz was so iconic from the very beginning that actually critics called it a mastery of music and movement and hailed Tchaikovsky's The Waltz of the Snowflakes, one of the most unique elements of the ballet. Here we see the original Waltz of the Snowflakes. In 1911, Anna Pavlova actually created a ballet, Snowflakes, with which she toured Europe and the United States, and in which the Washington Ballet co-founder, Lisa Gardner, performed as a company member. One of the other most popular elements of the Nutcracker was the dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, and this was popularized by the English ballerina, Alicia Markova, who starred in the first full-length Nutcracker outside of Russia in 1934, with the Vic Wells Ballet, which is now the Royal Ballet. Now, Markova also brought the magic of the Sugar Plum Fairy to America in an abridged production by the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo to New York in 1940. Balanchine's own Nutcracker from 1954 for the New York City Ballet amplified the majesty and glamour of the Sugar Plum Fairy by reviving a stage trick of Lev Ivanov's in which the ballerina appears to glide across the stage with her leg extended behind her in arabesque. And we see here Maria Tallchief our first Sugar Plum Fairy for New York City Ballet. Balanchine's whimsical snowflake costumes from the Waltz of the Snowflakes by Karinska also evoked the wonder of his childhood in Imperial Russia. Now, Julie, as the theme of childhood is central to the Nutcracker, I have to ask you, Julie, what was the first Nutcracker that you watched as a child? Good morning, Julie, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, Nutcracker, the first one that I saw was the televised production uh, of Mikhail Baryshnikov mm -hmm. uh, when, that he created for American Ballet Theater. Um, so that was the first Nutcracker production that I, I saw on mm -hmm. television. And it actually was the first Nutcracker production I, I ever danced. Um, I as many of you know, uh, grew up in, in the Washington area and I was a student at the Maryland Youth Ballet. And Mrs. Fonseca, out of respect um, and deference to Miss Day, did not uh, mount a production of the Nutcracker at the holiday season. She developed her own original ballet called The Enchanted Clock. And so I, I grew up dancing this uh, um, original ballet and um, it wasn't until I, that's actually my, my entryway to my professional career was through the Nutcracker because they um, were looking for extra dancers to supplement uh, the very large corps de ballet in the snowflake scene and the Waltz of the Flowers. And so that's how I, how I actually came to ABT was through, through the Nutcracker as an apprentice. 
That's so fascinating. Could you tell us more about that first experience with ABT and then what roles did you develop over the course of your career? <laughs> right. So when I joined um, when I joined ABT, I <laughs> I was a child in the party scene, mm -hmm. which I loved one of my, you know, f favorite roles. Um, as a young dancer, as you might imagine, I was 16, so I was certainly closest in age to uh, a child in the party scene than many of the other dancers in the company. And then I was also a snowflake and I understudied the Walls of the Flowers. Um, and it wasn't until uh, later as I advanced in my career that I was invited to come in productions around the country uh, to perform the role of Sugar Plum Fairy. Mm -hmm. And so I, and there I am. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and here as a little, uh, I brought some of my tiaras uh, just to show. <laughs> Those are beautiful. <laughs> they, they are beautiful and I actually made them myself. But um, as I advanced uh, through my career, I was invited to perform all over the country as a sugar plum fairy. And uh, I, I danced 20 years in, in a Texas Ballet Theater. I danced in uh, Chicago and Iowa and Florida. And, and I also, uh, this, this photo here is from Kevin McKenzie's production at ABT. Uh, which I premiered uh, with Robert Hill as the Sugar Plum Fairy and Cavalier. Um, we premiered that at um, the, the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in Los Angeles in, in the 90s. Um, and uh, I also had the great privilege of dancing Balanchine's Nutcracker for many years at Stanford in Stanford, Stanford Connecticut, mm -hmm. um, where for, for a good 20 years, the School of American Ballet, um, the School for New York City Ballet, uh, put on a production with the local uh, Stanford City Ballet School of Balanchine's Nutcracker. And I got a call one day um, from David Richardson, who was the ballet master for that production, uh, mm -hmm. saying that Darcy Kistler, who's a, a famous ballerina at New York City Ballet, was injured and could I dance with Jock Soto, uh, the Valentine um, Nutcracker, which I did not know. And so they had done a, just a wonderful filming of Valentine's Nutcracker starling, starring Macaulay Culkin as the prince and Damian Wetzel and Darcy Kistler as the Sugar Plum Fairy and Cavalier. So I got that DVD, it was probably a video cassette at that time, watched it, studied it, showed up in Stanford um, in the morning, had one rehearsal with Jock Soto, who, um, for those of you who don't know, had an has an incredible reputation for one of the greatest partners ever. Um, and so he whisked me through this incredible pas de deux. And, and um, for years afterwards, I ended up dancing uh, that production with Damien Wetzel. So I, uh, when you mentioned the ballerina gliding across the stage on one point, um, oh, it is very thrilling. And it, it's amazing what you can do with um, a, a strong wire and a, just a little tiny platform. Yeah. Some uh, our power, men, the, the men and the crew pulling the string. So uh, great memories, I think that, uh, you know, um, it going around uh, the country dancing such a, an incredible ballet with so many children mm -hmm. who have been putting their heart and soul and time and effort and all the families and parents that are coming to watch and you know it's it just was uh, always just uh, ushered in the holiday seasons in, in a really beautiful way well, could you talk a little bit about, I know your daughter Josephine is a student at the Washington School of Ballet and the Nutcracker really serves as a gateway to the ballet community as you've, as you've referenced. Could you talk about how that feels to see the next generation coming up in the Nutcracker? Well, I, that's exactly, um, that's exactly what makes the Nutcracker um, such an incredible, um, incredibly loved, LA is mm -hmm. that 
um, it is the gateway for so many young dancers in their um, first time on the stage, first time to feel the magic of the lights, to hear the, the music sort of pouring over you, to hear applause, um, to feel um, that beautiful as a performer, both being seen and part of a group. And so um, you feel like as if all eyes are on you, but you also feel the strength and the community of all those on the stage. Mm -hmm. These are really powerful emotions for, well, for dancers and performers of all ages, but the impact of that on young, uh, young dancers is, mm -hmm. is unforgettable. And um, to see that in um, in the you know, third generation of, of my family, uh, yeah. ballet um, uh, lovers and, and dancers, um, for Victor and I, uh, we we're just, you know, like any other parent in the audience, just all our eyes <laughs> peeled on our daughter and just celebrating the effort that she put into it. And, and like every, you know, pr proud family member, just really enjoying um, the whole experience that that uh, ballet has to offer, from you know the studies in the school, the the seriousness of the uh, the form, and then what you do with that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. By the performance, so yeah. Well, another reason, of course, the ballet is so beloved is, of course, Tchaikovsky's iconic score. So let's turn to our guest today to unpack the unique qualities and brilliant orchestration of the Nutcracker. Yes. We're, yes. <laughs> we're honored to have with us today two renowned musical experts and practitioners. Charles Barker is currently the principal conductor of American, American Ballet Theater and music director for the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater. Charles brings with him the extensive experience of conducting orchestras worldwide, as well as I noticed Charles composing his own music for the Barnard Columbia Ancient Drama Group. Our second featured guest today is Dr. Simon Morrison. Dr. Morrison is the author of numerous books, including Bolshoi Confidential, Secrets of the Russian Ballet, From the Rule of the Tsars to Today. Professor Morrison currently serves as professor of music at Princeton University, where he's led numerous restoration projects on composers ranging from Cole Porter to Sergei Prokofiev. And of interest to Julie, that Simon's Romeo and Juliet was restored for the Mark Morris Dance Group. So Julie's iconic interpretation of Juliet there um, is relevant. So Charles and Simon, welcome. How are you today? Well, thank you very much uh, for having having us. and. Um, uh, hello to everybody, uh, and yeah, thank you, Julie. And I didn't know the story uh, about uh, the, doing the Balanchine uh, uh, Nutcracker on one rehearsal, and, and at least you got a rehearsal uh, because that was my intro. And blue, uh, <laughs> intro of that I did, or was that they called me up and said, "Come on out to LA and, and uh, do Misha's Nutcracker," and so I had no rehearsal at all. I just walked out into the orchestra pit, and, and the musicians looked up at. Who the heck is this guy? <laughs> so that was, that was kind of fun. Um, uh, and the dancers looked into the pit and said the same thing. Who the heck is this? <laughs> like, what is going on down there? <laughs> no, uh, now, Charles, we were just talking with Julie about Dance with the Sugar Plum Fairy. That music is so iconic. I think all, all of our audience members really recognize that associated with the Nutcracker. What makes the music so unique? Well, it's, it's this instrument called the celeste, but uh, mm -hmm. I, let me just call my, my lovely wife, who was uh, a principal dancer with the uh, Australian Ballet. Uh, her name is Miranda Coney, uh, but not to come and dance, but to bring me my, my electric cord because I see that my power is drained. So hang on one second. Oh, well, Miranda, could you bring my electric cord, please? She's lovely. And um, uh, Thank goodness, and I've got kind of married into this uh, world of dance. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a son who is. Uh, well, you can come in. It's okay. Uh, I married into this world of dance, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I have a son who is uh, a student now at the JKO school, and uh, he is uh, very talented. He was in the Prix de Lausanne last year, the, the the kind of famous competition for young dancers, mm -hmm. and. Uh, got home just before the whole shutdown happened. Oh, wow. So that was lucky. 
But um, all right, look, getting back to, to the uh, to us. Right. Uh, there was this family of um, of um, uh, instrument builders in um, in Paris uh, called the Mustels, and uh, they had a shop. And they made organs and keyboard instruments, harpsichords, etc. And they kept trying to come up with new ideas. So the son, Auguste Mustel, developed this instrument called the, that he called the Teleste. That that uh, was not like a piano that has the hammers hit the strings from underneath, or like a harpsichord which plucks the, the strings. This had hammers that fell upon a metal bar from above, and it was uh, it was uh, caused by a keyboard. So it was kind of like playing a, a xylophone, but you could do it with a keyboard. And he tried to sell it to various people, and nobody really picked up on it. They didn't really buy it. This is about 1882, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, it, it was it kind of sat, sat by itself uh, for several years, and, and no composer was particularly interested. And um, uh, in 1891, uh, Tchaikovsky was on his way to New York City to open Carnegie Hall, and he stopped in Paris because, well, that's kind of what people do, I guess. You stop in Paris, and um, he had heard about this instrument, and so he went to the Mustel store, which actually is still in Paris. It's not; it's no longer a music store, but it, it's, you can still see the sign outside. And um, he asked for a demonstration, and he had it, and and he um, a bit, and kept it very nonchalant and very cool and, and said thank you very much to Mr. Mustel and went back to his hotel, quickly wrote to his publisher, Jurgensen, and said, buy two of these instruments, crate them up and ship them back to St. Petersburg to have them ready for when I, my return from New York. Mm -hmm. And the last sentence of the um, uh, of the letter is, is remarkable. It's, it says, uh, I don't want you to show this to less to anyone especially not Rimsky Korsakov or Glazunov. <laughs> he was expecting them to steal it, which they probably would have. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be the very first person to use it. So uh, it, it's, a, it's kind of a fun story. Uh, the, after uh, uh, Tchaikovsky got back from New York and the great success opening Carnegie Hall, uh, he, he uh, worked on the Sugar Plum Ferry and uh, Interestingly enough, he, he didn't just kind of bury it in the orchestration. Mm -hmm. he, he put it in a place that was the apex, the, the, the most prominent place of the ballet, mm -hmm. which is in the pas de deux, mm -hmm. and it is the female variation. Mm -hmm. And it's also the solo instrument. So he took this instrument that nobody had ever heard before, and he brought it to, a, to the, his new ballet, which was, mm -hmm. of course, going to be uh, you know, uh, seen by many people, including the royal family. And he put it at this very salient spot, this most critical spot, not knowing exactly what would happen. Mm -hmm. the, one of the problems with the, music, with the instrument in the first place is that it's not very loud. You can't really control the volume very well. Today we can because we can mic it, but then of course they could so his accompaniment is very soft. It's just pizzicato strings playing piano. And uh, the, but the, the fact that Tchaikovsky put it at this most important spot to me makes him like the evil Knievel of uh, composers. Right. You know, he, he was such a daredevil to do something like that. What are some of the other daring innovations that you would, you would consider um, Tchaikovsky's contribution to the score? Uh, well, I really love the fact that, that the uh, Act Two begins with the Barca Roll, which is being on that boat, which transports you from one kingdom to the next kingdom, and mm -hmm. uh, the, the the kind of quasi Barca Roll that begins Act Two of La Bayadere, that has all of the, the the ballerinas taking the the audience from the world of reality into the drug dream world of mm -hmm. Soar is a good example. But now we get to go to the kingdom of the Swedes, and so Tchaikovsky uses a barca roll to transport us. Mm -hmm. And when we get to the kingdom of the Swedes, there's this uh, magical use of uh, a technique that the flutes use uh, called mm -hmm. frullato, where they they trill their their R's as they're playing. And in the very beginning of uh, the kingdom of the Swedes, the of uh, three flutes play these descending arpeggios and, and they sound kind of like 
<laughs> and it has this kind of uh, special shimmering type of effect. And uh, uh, it's uh, that was the, 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 one of the first times it was used. Mm -hmm. And very interesting. Now, Charles, how did um, how did Tchaikovsky's relationship with Petipa, the lead choreographer on this, go? Do you know if if Petipa had any influence, his sort of French influences on the Russian score? Well, Tchaikovsky grew up, of course, speaking both French mm -hmm. and uh, Russian, and so so uh, I expect the influences that Petipa had on him were were shared. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't as if it, it was imposed upon him, but. Um, uh, having done uh, recently the uh, Drigo ballet, Harlequinade, and the, the coda of the act two starts with uh, uh, the tune for He's a Jolly Good Fellow. Now, the, as it turns out, the British adopted a French folk tune, uh, and uh, Petipa had asked Drigo to put this tune into Harlequinade. So it made me think that probably Petipa also asked Tchaikovsky to use folk tunes from his youth, and those that maybe Tchaikovsky had knew already, and put them into the Nutcracker. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just I have a couple of examples. Um, Wonderful. The, uh, the uh, uh, children's dance right before the entrance of Drosselmeyer in Act One is a is a song called Monsieur du Molay about uh, warning a man who's going to the French port city of uh, Saint Malo. Uh, that it's filled with pickpockets and thieves, and so you'd better watch out. Mm -hmm. And also kind of interesting, because here comes Drosselmeyer, he's on his way. So let me play the Tchaikovsky first, and then I'll play Monsieur du Molay. Have to turn my speaker on. <laughs> Now, of course, Tchaikovsky's orchestration is just brilliant. In fact, I can't think of any other Tchaikovsky score that is more perfectly and fantastically orchestrated than Nutcracker. But now let me play Bon Voyage, Monsieur du Molay. <laughs> Monsieur du Molay, à Saint-Malo débarquer son naufrage. Bon voyage, Monsieur du Molay, et revenez s'il vous plaît, s'il vous plaît. So this is a song from the revolutionary time and something that I, that, that uh, Petipa certainly knew and uh, probably Tchaikovsky did as well. Uh, now, the, the next is not a French folk tune, it's a German folk tune. Uh, it's the, the grandfather's dance uh, in the Nutcracker, which for my money is more Viennese than any Viennese composer had, has, had ever written. But um, it's from a, a dance that's when grandfather took grandmother. And uh, Schumann used it in um, uh, Papillon. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. The, um, uh, you, you mentioned that, that I did some composing. It was a while ago. And mm -hmm. I, I understand that it's very, uh, it, composers need this sort of uh, inspiration and that that a, a folk tune could be the inspiration is uh, very common i i looked to bach i would i was i'm a violinist and i would i would get out his uh, sonatas and partitas and i just played through them and see if i could get some sort of you know something that would give me an inspiration to put no doubt on paper so that tchaikovsky did this uh, it's it seems perfectly natural mm -hmm. all right the uh, let me play the uh, the grandfather's dance I so look forward to that every year. 
just that those 60 seconds elevate my soul for 14 times a, a year. And it just is such a wonderful experience. All right, now let me play the uh, German folk tune. Actually, there are two German folk tunes that, that Tchaikovsky put together. And the next one, this is, which is the second part. How charming! It just it's such a such a beautiful song, and that Tchaikovsky made them into this beautiful Viennese moment uh, is a tribute to his genius, definitely. Uh, the last one was uh, from Act Two. It's uh, Mother Ginger, and. Uh, Tchaikovsky used these two, uh, uh, used uh, two songs uh, from, uh, uh, also from the revolution. One is uh, Girofle, Girofla, which is about a wallflower. And uh, the second one is uh, a song called uh, Cadet Roussel about a naughty little boy. <laughs> Here's the Tchaikovsky. <laughs> Right, and now the uh, Girofle Girofla. And the second part of Mother Ginger is Cadet Roussel. So that that Tchaikovsky kind of pulled these little tunes out of the out of his hat and and then made them into something as fantastic and magical and uh, of worth repeating mm -hmm. millions of times. Every year, all over the world, I, I just think is is uh, you know a real tribute to, to him. You can certainly hear the book tune so wonderfully when you illustrate that, Charles. Thank you so much for bringing all of those examples, so that it will enrich our understanding of the score. Um, Simon, I'd like to ask Simon a few questions now. So we've talked about the French influence, the German influence. Um, what about Lev Ivanov, the second choreographer on the Nutcracker and, and the choreographer that actually the Soviets often sort of gave him authorship of, um, of the Nutcracker, the choreography. Could you talk a little bit about Tchaikovsky and Lev Ivanov and perhaps the, the other sort of most famous ballet, um, part of the ballet that we recognize, Waltz of the Snowflakes? Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm um, I'm a great supporter of the Washington's production of this of this show and this immensely popular ballet. Um, obviously, uh, in the 19th century, Marius Katipa is supreme. He's uh, the most dominant choreographer. And if you think about the history of ballet, there there aren't actually that many um, colossally important choreographers when, say, compared to the history of music, where you can name you know, hundreds of composers, really great choreographers, uh, prominent choreographers who had long lives. There are relatively few of them. So Petipa was dominant. He came to the Imperial Theaters in St. Petersburg via France and Spain, and he had 60 years there. Um, but uh, what's fascinating about him is that uh, his masterpieces um, are from late in his life uh, when he was an octogenarian and uh, he fell ill while working on this project. Um, the instigation for the Nutcracker was not his directly, nor was it Tchaikovsky's. It came from the boss of the Imperial Theatres, a person named Ivan Sivoloshky, 
who was somebody who was deeply invested in French culture and Italian culture and collected furniture and art and really stuffed the productions of the Imperial Theatres with a lot of the stuff that he got from the West. And uh, he authored the scenario of this work uh, after Hoffman. And uh, he assigned uh, the choreography to Petit Pa, who turned to Tchaikovsky because Tchaikovsky had created Sleeping Beauty, which was an immense success, a synesthetic success in terms of blending sound and, and color and all of the senses, and uh, thought that it would work for this, this work dealing with childhood and, and the way children look at the world. And uh, Petipa, unfortunately, was battling a myriad of elements and, and fell sick. And so his design of the choreography was limited to the big set pieces. Uh, he was somebody known for working with an expanded corps de ballet. And so he assembled the Waltz of the Snowflakes, or the Waltz of the Flowers, these large um, kind of aristocratic and uh, architectural designs, which really resonated with the grandeur of the imperial state. That left a lot of the busy work and the smaller pieces to his assistant, Lev Ivanov. And we don't know exactly what uh, the balance in duties was uh, between the two of them in their years working together, but we suspect that most of the choreography of Nutcracker was done by Ivanov with just these sort of larger architectural contributions from Petit Pa. Uh, and the Soviets afterwards really, um, in a way to sort of distance uh, the Russian balladic heritage from um, imperial politics. And Petit Pa actually credited Ivanov, uh, the Russian, with most of this work. Mm -hmm. And you notice as well in the program we showed earlier from 1961, the Mary Day production um, with Alexandra Danilova, she also acknowledges her choreography as being after Ivanov. So it's, it's interesting, um, the sort of political element of who gets credit for what yeah. in the production of the ballet. Um, I know, Simon, you're also currently writing a book on Tchaikovsky. Could you tell us a bit more about what was going on in Tchaikovsky's life during his composition of The Nutcracker? Um, sure. He uh, was in top form. Uh, he died prematurely of cholera at age 53, only just over a year after the premiere of this work. And it was a calamity and ghastly demise uh, that no one expected in St. Petersburg. It was a bad very bad period, a very bad infection. But uh, he was in top form. He was uh, beloved, admired. He was uh, close to the court. He was involved with running actually a children's orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, he um, could kind of pick and choose commissions. And he was very close to the Imperial Theatres and was really welcomed into the fold of the Imperial Theatres as the number one Russian composer. He was a court composer. Uh, which uh, distinguishes him from other Russian composers active at the time, like, say, Rimsky-Korsakov, who was referenced earlier. Um, so he was the cosmopolitan chosen one, and uh, Sivoloshki handed him this commission. And um, he was somewhat ambivalent about it. Uh, he was also simultaneously working on an opera, Iolanta, which was uh, premiered on the same night as The Nutcracker as part of a double bill and that's a work about a blind girl, a child, uh, whose father uh, refuses to let anyone around her uh, know that she has this you know, disability. Um, and it's about child's insight. And so it's a nice pairing with Nutcracker on one hand. But Tchaikovsky was ambivalent about the project. He um, had the equivalent for him, which is rare, of, of kind of creator's block, creative block. And when he took the train out to Paris, I encountered the Celeste, as was described by Charles, um, and toured. Um, you know, he had some musical inspiration, but I think what got him through the block was primarily a loss, uh, the fact that his beloved sister, Sasha Alexandra, died. And um, what motivated the score, besides his real fascination with how young people look at the world, contra adults, mm -hmm. was uh, a lot of memories of being with her as a child. And so some of the music that informs coffee, Arabian dance, and the Chinese tea comes from memories of childhood with her. And even the snow that whisked around the house where she lived, I think that informs some of the magic of the snowflakes waltz. Um, I can go into some specifics about the work if we have time. Should I do that? Or? Yes, that would be perfect. Um, one of the things that strikes me is how um, the, this is, this is a work for and about childhood, but it was written by adults and children danced in the first half of this work. Um, so they brought in, you know, the young people of the Imperial Ballet School to feature in the opening pantomime. 
But um, a lot of it is about the sort of loss of childhood and melancholia. So, you know, his sister dies and he feels that and he builds that kind of loss into the work. And there's there are beautiful moments both in the orchestration and in the relationship between major and minor keys that suggests him kind of always wanting to add a dark lining to things that are bright and sparkling. Um, somebody who knew Russian culture of the 19th and 20th centuries intimately, Larissa Safi, I've talked about the fact that the Celeste music for the sleep for the sugar plum fairy has this quality of being like metal tears of the sort of ballerina, uh, which is a really striking kind of and strange image. There are ways in which the orchestration is wrong. Uh, it seems to be upside down and distorted. So when you listen to the Waltz of the Flowers, you have this huge kind of leaden tuba quality bringing it down, which doesn't seem to be very much in support of the idea of flowers growing up. But um, it's, it's again, a kind of Lilliputian distortion of perspective that is kind of child's perspective. Um, the uh, big uh, pas de deux theme, Di -da 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 -dum -da -da -dum, which is just a scale in G, uh, lavishly orchestrated, but that da -da 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 -dum, um, drops down to an E, which turns major into minor, giving it this quality of, again, a slight sadness to it. There's also a lot of, um, as was identified by a wonderful ballet scholar and Roland John Wiley, a lot of this T, 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 T rhythm throughout the ballet, which has been, you know, associated convincingly or not with some of the strains of a kind of, you know, requiem service. So it's, there's this sort of idea of celebrating childhood and presenting a childhood's perspective, but at the same time sort of marking its loss. And I think um, the ultimate and most complicated example of that is the Waltz of the Snowflakes, where you have, you know, this iterated de -ta, de -ta, ta, syncopated pat offbeat pattern over and over again. And it's called the Waltz of the Snowflakes, but it doesn't settle into a waltz meter, one, two, three, one, two, three, for quite a while. And instead you have this D, 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 dropping, which is kind of a chacon pattern where you have a repeated bass figure. And that chacon is something associated with fate. And um, it's, it's, it's odd and strange to think about on one hand, he's, he's giving you this surrealistic child's perspective on the world through these strange instrumental combinations and the discovery of new sounds like the celesta, but at the same time, he's, he's kind of marking the positivity again with something a little more somber. Now, the Nutcracker was actually the final ballet that Tchaikovsky composed prior to his death in 1893. And it's certainly the ballet that looms the largest, I think, in the popular imagination. Um, Julie, could you talk a little bit about why the Nutcracker has become such an institution in American culture today? Well, I, I think that Simon and, and Charles in their remarks uncovered uh, a lot of why it speaks to um a broad popular culture because there's so much humanity family orientation and and this sense of a child's experience um through life and and um you know what it it has over the since um the Christensen Brothers production, the first Nutcracker in uh, San, for San Francisco Ballet, Balanchine's production, Mary Day and Danielova's production. In the 70 years that has come to this country, it's, it's not just become part of popular culture like Swan Lake, but it's almost transcended mm -hmm. into American culture. And so, <laughs> What I, I find um, fascinating is, and, and what I have found fascinating in our research that we've done on both Sleeping Beauty and Swan Lake, is how mm -hmm. things get to be how they are. And going back to learn about how the, the original uh, intention, original idea, original inspirations, um, and how that over time they have then been altered, adapted, taken on, changed, um, and moved forward. But it's fascinating from what I've learned today that the roots of so many of, of what are still relevant today are centered on um, mm -hmm. 
family relationships and nostalgia and while you know sort of hopes but also uh somewhat at sadness of growth of, of life. Exactly. Right? That, that, so Julie, you journey. mentioned you mentioned so. your work on Sleeping Beauty and Swan Lake, the original Stepanov notation, the choreographic notes by Marius Petipa. So we have the Stepanov notation, of course, for the Nutcracker as well. If you were to restage a production of the Nutcracker, how would you create something that's both true to its classical legacy, its Russian roots, but also still appeals to a contemporary American and a global audience? Right. Well, I mean, I think as I, um, <laughs> as my own professional experience, I I think makes clear, I've danced in Nutcracker productions all over the country, mm -hmm. and they've all been loved. People love the general story, they love the music, and they take ownership of whatever production that their community is putting on. So again, it's sort of become part of it, it's become part of each community's experience once a year. So I, I think that um, it's a it it is strong enough to take any really kind of interpretation. Um, look at Mark Morris's uh, interpretation. That's totally you know departure from uh, Petipa. So um, you know I I have. Uh, in my own um, thoughts for what would be the next chapter for production for the Washington Ballet. Um, I, I have a choreographer in mind that I have approached and in that, you know, that's a, a process, a multi-year process. Um, and, but what I would love to explore with that choreographer is, is all this kind of um, history because it, like anything, it it just knowledge is the 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 depth of understanding of a piece of music and a piece of art, and then the culture that's influenced it over a century um, will will only help to strengthen it as we push it into uh, closer to the twenty second century. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. well, looking forward very much um, to the next production, whatever that may be, when yeah. it will come, and to Septim's continuing into the near future as yes. well. Yes. So we're getting so many questions. Um, let's turn to our audience now and um, and bring some of their questions. First of all, from Blake, our composer, Blake Neely. Hi, Julie. What is your best guess of the number of times you've danced this ballet? Hi, Blake. Thank you for joining us early in California. <laughs> um, I would reckon, um, well, <laughs> 30 years times, what do you think, Charles? Maybe 14 performances a year on average. Some years it was more, some years it was less. So um, a lot. <laughs> exactly. Let's see, we have another question from Tony Stefano. Would Tchaikovsky have the same artistic freedom today in being able to pull or incorporate other composers' pieces into his own orchestration? So who would like to, yeah. Mm -hmm. Simon, um, would he yeah, have the Simon same Oliver. freedom today? Yeah, sure. Um, the uh, Right now we're in a stage, if you think about Alexei Ratmansky, who commissions a lot of pieces mm -hmm. from composers like Vsyatnikov and so forth, and they're free to work with him and develop ideas. The idea of borrowing uh, versus plagiarizing is a fraught question. You have to remember that in the 19th century, composers really didn't have to deal with a lot of copyright problems as they did in the 20th century and certainly in the West. So that's an issue, but you know, it's fair game for, I think, if, if it means something, you know, if there's a, a kind of layer, layer of, yeah, motion or psychology you can add by borrowing something or some reference to history. I think it's that's fair game. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, in the uh, Strauss um, uh, whipped cream that we do, it, Strauss borrowed from Mozart in several different places. 
and uh, just kind of lifted the, lifted the melodies. Then he changed the orchestration, he changed the timing, he changed the, uh, the major to minor. Uh, but it, but uh, it, it, it has happened all throughout history, and I'm sure it happens today. It's just that that you couldn't take a piece of music that that is copyrighted and use that. You could use a folk tune. I'm sure that would be perfectly perfectly legal. Yeah, and I think the nice thing about the score of the Nutcracker with all of these borrowings is it's 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 a good way to represent what a party is like, right? Where you hear these snatches of conversation from different places you know, coming in and out of the ear. Mm -hmm. Now we have a question from Martha, um, oh, to me. I'd like to ask Dr. Ruland about the shuffling step the angels perform under camouflage of costume to give the impression of gliding. Does the step have a name and is it folk derived? And this Martha is uh, referring to the New York City Ballet, George Balanchine's The Nutcracker. Um, and actually, yes, this, this dance, um, was very much influenced by Russian folk dance. And you can see there was a, a Russian folk troupe founded in 1948 um, called Viroska, which is the birch, birch trees. Um, and, and they perform this kind of magical step where they appear to be gliding. So I think there's also, I've also read that there's actually a Georgian influence. I don't know if Simon or Charles, you're familiar with this particular step. Um, but I think there also is a Georgian element as well, which takes us back to Balanchine's, um, going back to Balanchine's, um, you know, Georgian father as well. Oh, from, oh, wonderful, from Mia. In, in Septime's Nutcracker, Clara looks in the mirror and sees herself as a young woman. She sees herself as a sugar plum fairy. Is there a connection in the score between Clara and the sugar plum fairy? Charles or me? <laughs> Probably, so I mean, I'm, I'm going to defer to you. <laughs> I, I don't see it any necessarily any, any uh, dramatic connection, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the exception of the of the finale. The sad uh, state state what the apotheosis, which has a it has that um, uh, Barcarolle tune uh, that returns, but but uh, act act one and act two are kind of two separate units. Uh, it's kind of like how Act Three of Sleeping Beauty is kind of a different piece of music than the prologue Act One and Act Two. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I see the acts as, as separated musically. Yeah, I would just say that um, one of the interesting and dominant features of the score, The Nutcracker, which was part of the reason why it didn't do so well when it was premiered in terms of reviews, was the fact that he you, Tchaikovsky really wanted to work with basic childlike materials, right? So that 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 is kind of like so the childlike sounds, tin drum, et cetera, et cetera, basic scales and so forth, and then do this magic in terms of orchestration and color, so that he could basically his kind of mantra seems to be I can take any sort of drivel and turn it into musical magic, and he did that often through um, both manipulation of rhythm and meter very carefully, and also having the timbres, you know, sort of liberated of instruments. And so what links the two sides is less specific melodies or harmonic combinations than the selection of instruments that go with specific characters. And that does cross, cross over between the acts. Mm -hmm. Let's see, do we have time, I think, for one last question? If we have any additional questions? I know um, someone had asked why Russian critics considered the first production a failure. Simon, could you talk about that? And maybe also a little bit about the stature of the Nutcracker in Russia today. Does it have the same sort of holiday um, tradition that we have in America? Um, sure. With regard to the premiere, um, it didn't come off very well. Um, people were baffled by the fact that you had this very experimental design where a lot of pantomime in the first act and then these set pieces in the second act, and that didn't translate. People didn't understand what was going on. The second issue was the fact that the uh, use of children um, in the first act was unusual rather than having a star uh, dancer you know, demonstrate. And so you have to wait a long time for the Sugar Plum Fairy to appear. There were some complaints about uh, the prima ballerina um, in terms of her, you know, she, I guess she appeared in a rather zaftig kind of guise that people criticized. Um, the other thing I would say is actually people knew the Hoffman source, short story very well. Um, it was very popular. And uh, they didn't understand why the Hoffman story had been changed so much. Um, it's a scarier story than the ballet. And, you know, children obviously can put up with a lot of scariness. And, but this work was, was, a lot of the scariness was taken out. And even some of the music 
where Drosselmeyer was a lot more chromatic and dark, and that was kind of pruned away. So that's that it was a basket of reasons, and I think it was probably a little bit under rehearsed given the fact that they were doing multiple shows and, and two at the same time for this one. With regard to the uh, tradition in Russia, well, the Soviets, you know, did away with you know Christmas as a kind of you know religious holiday, and so and the Nutcracker was pushed forward to sort of a New Year's celebration, and performed at odd times of the year. And um, right now, one of the hottest tickets, I think, of Bolshoi is the New Year's Eve midnight performance of Nutcracker, which I think is about $1,500 a pop, unless you get comps. So um, it's, it's coveted, but it's not, it's not a Christmas time show. Right. That's fascinating. Well, thank you so much to Julie, Simon, and Charles for this really wonderful right. conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to our Balletomon Society, our subscribers, and our donors for your continued commitment to the Washington Ballet. Thank you for joining us to talk about the Nutcracker today. And we look forward to seeing you on January 8th for our next episode of Bar Talk. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye.